Welcome to Private Banking Strategies Podcast with Vance Lowe and Seth Hicks, your secret weapon to protect your assets and never have to start over financially again. Vance and Seth help high net worth individuals, families, business owners, and investors structure an asset-protected, tax-free fortress for their families. Learn how to keep what you earn and use the velocity of money to create your own private banking system. Join us on this journey as we explore the secret strategies of the rich and political elite and help you take total control of your financial security. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to Private Banking Strategies with Vance Lowe and Seth Hicks. Today, Vance is out of the office. It's just Seth and I. Seth, what's going on? Hey, Eric. Glad to be here, man. Excited about this topic, especially in light of recent bank failures. And Mm. I think we've got some important information to bring people. Yeah, a lot of headlines, a lot of things going around, a lot of people getting nervous. And that just is the way it is these days. There's always something on the news. But I don't think lately, you know, all the stuff that they've been putting on the news just to do scare factor and all that jazz, it's just kind of been not made up by any means, but they kind of overplay things, but not this time. When you're talking bank failures, that's not overplaying anything. That's a that's a really serious issue. Yeah, the, the Silicon Valley bank failure, $209 billion. It's a, it's a mid-tier bank. It's the second largest bank failure in American history with WAMU being the first in 2008. It went down with about $309 billion in assets. So it's a big deal. And that's why at Private Banking Strategies, the number one pillar is asset protection. And one thing we focus on is helping people keep what they make. Mm -hmm. If you earn all this and you lose it because your bank steals it from you or because of taxes or a multitude of other reasons, what good has it done you? Yeah. Yeah. And for those that are just joining us, there are seven pillars early on in their podcasting career. Vance and Seth did a great job of describing the seven pillars. So go back and listen to some of those original podcasts. But today, I think asset protection is really the theme. Absolutely. So that's why it's the number one pillar of private banking strategies is you want to protect your assets, keep what you make. And we've been talking about this for months and years in relationship to bank bail-ins and the Dodd-Frank Act. And people often think, you know, the money that I put in my bank is my money. And when I need it, it'll be there. And actually, that's not the case. Dodd-Frank Act, misnamed the Consumer Protection Act, it's misnamed because it has nothing to do with consumer protection, has everything to do with bank protection. Effectively, I'll summarize it in saying that the money that you put in those banks are effectively it's it's at risk for the bank to bail in if they become insolvent mm-hmm. and your bank statement is effectively an IOU so you you know you think well there's my money it's on my statement that's that's an IOU and if the bank becomes insolvent they have the ability through the Dodd-Frank Act to bail in on depositors money to make uh, the bank solvent And in return, you'll get pennies on the dollar or you'll get bank stock in an insolvent bank. Uh, Neither one of those sound good to me. How about you? Yeah, no, I'm no bueno at all. (laughs) Nobody wants to have a bank take their money out from underneath them. And after charging them with fees and negative interest rates for the past two decades, it's just not the right way to do it. Let's dig in here a little bit, Eric. We're going to go to some fundamentals on why the banks are not solvent and some philosophical reasons in banking as to uh, why that is. Now, a lot of times we have folks come to us that may be very wealthy and they think that they're pretty sharp when it comes to money. They've made a lot of money, but in effect, they don't really know how money works. They may think they do, but when you start breaking down these components and getting into the details of how banks make money and how they're making money off of you, people aren't aware of it. So, 
effectively, you know, we try to teach people to be their own bank Mm -hmm. and implement the same principles that banks institute only in their own family economy. In the banking industry, we've talked about this before, Eric, so you're familiar with it, but branch banking is effectively a new phenomenon of American culture. Before the 60s, banking was done through life insurance policies and had been for hundreds of years. But in the 70s, branch banking became the norm. They even took it into public schools. And you may remember when you were a child, them encouraging you to open up a savings account with your local bank. Do you, did you ever have that happen to you? Yeah. I remember when we were, when we were kids, it was, I think it was probably in fifth or sixth grade, right? At the end of grade school, they had somebody come talk to us about different things. Cause we did a, like a, we ran an economy in our sixth, it was sixth grade class now that I remember, we ran our own economy for a week. We all had our own little private businesses. We had all that. And there was a somebody that came in and talked about the importance of savings accounts and making sure you've got your money in a safe place and yada, yada, yada. But yeah, that was in sixth grade way back when. And one of the reasons that that was brought into school systems is because they wanted people to use the branch banks and the banks wanted control of the money. And there's there's a famous quote that says, I, I don't care who makes the laws. I, I, I want to be the banker who, <laughs> who has the money, mm-hmm. who effectively is above the lawmakers. And we see that in our own society now, that the bankers are effectively pulling politician strings. There's lobbyists. There's all sorts of financial ties and cords that dictate policy and dictate legislation and dictate laws and, and people who are in office. And it's upside down in effect. And so schools were complicit in allowing the banksters, I like to call them, coming in and brainwashing kids and brainwashing Americans into thinking that we have to use branch banking. But in effect, you don't. And and we're, I'm going to tell you why it's a good idea in these next coming slides to create your own bank and get out of a system that is doing nothing for you. Yeah. And for those that are listening in on this podcast, understand that you can go to the YouTube channel and you will see a presentation of this. Seth and I are just going to talk through the slides. He's going to explain a lot more and he'll explain it so you can continue to listen to the podcast. Don't turn away from this. However, if you want to see some visuals, they will be on the YouTube channel. So why do banks want control of your deposits and loans? Let's take a look at how they function and and why you want to be the bank. Banks operate on what's called the fractional reserve system. Fractional reserve banking means that when someone brings a $100,000 deposit into the bank, the bank only has to keep a fraction, and we'll call it 10%, which is actually generous. And if it's a large bank, they don't even have to keep 10%. They may have to only keep 5%. But for our purposes and simple math, we'll call it 10%. So your $100,000 deposit, they take 10,000, put it in reserve. They take the other $90,000 of your money and they begin to loan it out in the form of home loans, car loans, business loans, and every other type of loan product that that they have. That's not money that they worked for. It's not money that they earned. It's simply money that you brought into them, probably because they're convenient and on the corner nearby where you live, and then effectively get to make money off of you. And they don't pay you anything for that. In fact, they generally charge you fees for housing your money at their bank, right? Yeah. Back in the day, you used to get a toaster, but I don't think they do that anymore. (laughs) Yeah. I would gladly hand out toasters for 90% of every deposit that we could go then loan on. Yeah. Right. Seriously. So every bank makes you know money off of these deposits and effectively that's the way it's been since branch banking was was instituted that's called fractional reserve banking um it's implicitly and inherently flawed and it only works so long as people have confidence in the bank and as soon as their confidence wanes and people begin to storm the bank for their deposits. All of the deposits are not there. And that's exactly what we just saw in the Silicon Valley bank failure. 
and the signature bank failure in New York and the prior bank failures like IndyMac. I was actually in Southern California at that time, and there were mounted patrol and tanks in Thousand Oaks, which is a suburban area around the IndyMac bank on Thousand Oaks Boulevard. And there were people very upset that they couldn't get their money out. There was total lack of confidence and IndyMac failed and people didn't get their money out. So that's how it plays out. Now, look at this graph here called the velocity of money. And it represents a $100,000 deposit into a bank and then a bank loaning a mortgage loan out at 6% someone selling that house. And th let's say that everybody banks at Wells Fargo in this particular map of transactions, they deposit their sales proceed back into the bank. The bank loans out for car loans, for construction loans, and the car dealer and the construction company all bank at Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo is getting a massive velocity on that very first initial $100,000 put in their bank. And it's multiplying exponentially with every time they can turn it in a loan. And so it's critical that they have your bank deposits. And that's why initially it was inbred into the culture. So <clears throat> with every cycle of the dollar, they're making another touch on the dollar, another another profit on the dollar. And we effectively can take back control of that money and do the exact same thing in our own private banking system. And that's called the velocity of money, getting more touches on the same dollar than you can when you just spend a dollar and it's gone. And that actually is much more important than an interest rate that is what's been sold to people. Hey, look at this interest rate. It's 6%. It's 5% over 30 years. And that's it's actually a fallacy. And when you can use your own money and you can pay yourself 15%, you can pay yourself 20% in your own banking transactions. If you've got the velocity of money working in your favor, that interest rate becomes insignificant. And in fact, when you're the banker, you want a higher interest rate. If you're the banker, you're, you want all of the interest compounding and growing in a tax-free system, which is what the private banking system does for you. Yeah. Do you see yourself in that story? Do you feel like you are generating a lot of revenue but are not moving forward as fast as you would like? Are you ready for help? Please call Private Banking Strategies at 817-200-4777 or visit us at www.privatebankingstrategies.com. Now, here's a slide where we talk about uh, someone that would I would fundamentally and philosophically differ from, as we talked about, Eric. This is uh, a slide that references a gentleman named Terry Burnham, who's a former Harvard economics professor, typically a, a left-leaning institution and a left-leaning in thought type of philosophy. Whereas with our systems, we're generally right-leaning. And But what Terry thought through and presented, and this was a number of years back, was his proposition that banks were not a safe place to store cash money because of a number of reasons. One, that he saw that the printing of money was increasing, and he saw that the curve on that printing of money was unsustainable and that banks ultimately with fractional reserve lending would become insolvent. And the next line of thought fallback is to the FDIC. The FDIC insures American deposits and they insure up to $250,000. I and mean, they have a sticker on the bank glass door when you walk in the door. Hey, you, you want to make sure that you're bank is, you know, FDIC insured, mm -hmm. right? I mean, is that, was that not drilled into your mind, Eric, as well? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, you see it on every, every little window it's there. Well, the FDIC will make it all good and make it all right. But when you actually look at the numbers and that's what Terry did, and he 
presented the fact at the particular time, Terry's calculations were end of 2017, they had 92 billion to cover 7 trillion, which was 1.3 cents of every dollar. Now, fast forward to the current day, 2022, end of 2022, last quarter, 20 trillion on deposit, 24 billion on hand to cover Mm -hmm. those. And you've only got a tenth of a penny to actually cover those deposits. That's in five years. Five That's a five-year change. That's crazy. So you've got effectively less than a 13th in five years is what has uh, happened as far as solvency goes. So $24 billion to cover $20 trillion, less than 1.3 cents on the dollar. But what are my options? I don't. I don't even. I'm not aware of any options. I don't know of any options. Well, that's what we're. That's what we're bringing to the table, and that's what we're trying to educate folks on is that there are options, and you're never going to get your money back if if you're bailed in on in a large banking crisis. It's it, it's absolutely not going to happen. Well, here, here's so, the thing. This is what struck me when we were talking about this last time, and now that and you're showing me this, it's just it's all flooding back. Do you remember the movie? It's a Wonderful Life. Sure. Yeah. So George, George is the, the protagonist, right? He, he's the main character. He works at the bank. He owns it. And there's a crisis, right? And so then there's a run on the bank and everybody's like, where's my money? And he's like, well, your money's in, in Susan's house and in Terry's farm and blah, blah, blah. Right. All the money's loaned out like you're talking about. But here's the thing. George works his hardest to scratch up some money to help people out. That's not real life. That is a movie. From this SVB bank, what we saw is everybody involved in the bank sold their shares, took millions of dollars, knowing that the bank was going under. They immediately took as much money as they could get their grubbing hands on and then took off, right? I mean, just said, okay, this bank isn't going to work out. Sorry, everybody. And everybody else's money was already tied up. And movies are cute, but reality is people are greedy. And I'm sorry, the whole thing with the... That bank failure angers me beyond belief because nobody was trying to help out the people that were members of the bank. They were helping each other out and their richest members who, of course, would scratch their back later, making sure that they all got their money out and let everybody else just fly in the wind. Absolutely. I mean, we know that from larger institutional depositors, they were making moves before the bank was placed in receivership. Yeah. Yeah. So they're getting private phone calls. They understand what's going on. They've got their finger on the pulse, but the little guy who's just unaware and working his, his regular routines day in and out, he he's oblivious to that. And he's the one that gets burned. She's the one that gets Mm -hmm. taken to task and is totally, you know, burned out of that. And so we're talking to the little people. We're talking to the people who, who, you know, have, um, something to lose. I read an article about this Israeli hedge fund group, and they were like almost incredulous that people weren't more aware that Silicon Valley Bank was going down and they'd pulled hundreds of millions of dollars out of this bank well before this mm-hmm. ever came to fruition. And they were diversifying those funds with other relationships they had and and uh, making sure that they didn't lose their investors' money. And so this is a way that you can take the banking equation back in your life. The small guy, the mom and pop, the regular red-blooded American can take the banking equation back and shore up their assets, their cash deposits, and make sure that they're actually asset protected. Yeah. And, and, and you said it great with the individual, the normal red-blooded American, the one that keeps spinning in my head because maybe because I'm in this situation is a small business owner. Now, I don't have any employees. I am my own business. I am my own employee. But there were small businesses that had accounts there that that their money was, the amount of money they had in there was over what was quote unquote insured by the FDIC. Those small businesses are now going to suffer. And the employees of those small businesses could suffer or get laid off because they don't have the funds. So it's, I'm thinking mainly about business owners in this situation. It's just not safe. 
Yeah, there's a massive trickle down effect. And there's commentary right now with experts analyzing what the ripple effect of just these couple of banks in the past weeks, what it could be. And you've got, like you said, I mean, the ripple effect rolls down into yeah. uh, employees, it rolls down into to pensions, it rolls down into things that people think are secure, and they're not. And mm. there there is a better way to bank, there is a better way to take yourself out of fractionalized banking. And effectively, this is the philosophical opposites between Keynesian economics and Austrian economics. And it's why throughout history, fractional lending is always going to lead to bank failure. It's the main cause for inflation and creating money just out of thin air is is unsustainable. Yeah. It's always yep. going to be unsustainable. There is no way that you can print your money, print your way out of crisis, and you could print more money and spend more money. That's been the philosophy for quite a while now. Spend more money, print more money. The the national debt's thirty one point five trillion and counting, and it, it, I mean over ten trillion of that's happened in, in like a parabolic hockey stick increase in the past decade and a half. And you go, wow, you know, how is that possible? Well, I saw a carton of eggs, twelve eggs that they wanted nine dollars for. Oh, good lord! Yeah. <laughs> nine dollars for 12 eggs wow or you know gasoline in california uh hitting tops at six dollars that those are related events when yeah. those prices begin to peak out and that's why we think this is so critical that people actually start thinking about how to protect themselves how to implement better strategies and private banking is is one of the best ways to be able to accomplish that and so that's what we're talking about asset protection eric today and it, you know it bears mentioning we say, say this all the time but for folks that haven't heard us talk before this all happens in a tax-free environment when you set your own private bank up in a carefully structured contract it's a tax-free economy your money that grows and compounds year after year tax-free your benefits and death benefits from these life insurance policies come off tax-free uh, you can take retirement distributions tax-free and that's unlike other government sponsored programs and you've got no tie to the traditional banking system or the the shifting sand of insolvency it's built on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, anything else we're covering in today's? Yeah, let's just, uh, well, folks, if you want to learn more about this, you can find us at privatebankingstrategies.com. It's privatebankingstrategies.com. And there we've got a free book offer that should pop up for you. And it's a book that's called What the Banks Don't Want You to Know. And effectively, we shine light on a lot of dark areas like the ones we're discussing here. And in, the book is written with a prospective analysis. And now we're looking in the rearview mirror, seeing that some of the things we said in the book have occurred now with the bank failures mm -hmm. and, and bail ins. And so I would encourage you to download that book. You can read it or you can listen to it. And from there, you can also dive off into hours and hours of podcast content that's organized on subject matter and seven pillars and various ways. And if those things resonate with you, schedule a call uh, with my partner, Vance, where he walks you through exactly how this can work for you and your family and ultimately lays out an eight-year roadmap for you. Yeah, that's fantastic. And for the listener, I know that Seth and I are going to be covering another podcast after this one, and it ties together. So if you're interested in how this strategy and the things that he spoke about today are affected by real estate, how you can get into real estate and use this strategy to, to help grow your assets. That's going to be on the next podcast. So I just wanted to tease that out there. Seth, great job today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate it. You bet. And our last thank you, of course, is to you listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Private Banking Strategies podcast with Seth Hicks. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Vance and Seth come out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. We humbly ask that you share this podcast, rate it, and leave a review, as this actually helps others find the show. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Private Banking Strategies, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day, and we'll see you next time.
Did that story feel like it was about you? Do you feel you should be making more progress toward your financial goals? Do you feel stuck? Let us help you get unstuck. Are you ready to take action and get your own private bank? Please call Private Banking Strategies at 817-200-4777 or visit us at www.privatebankingstrategies.com. Thank you for listening to the Private Banking Strategies Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of private banking strategies. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.